Welcome, everyone. Welcome back. This is Susie Moser with Unit 2 of our Climate Change Communication course. I'm delighted that you're here and that we um, can continue this journey to learn about effective climate change communication. Let me just dive right in and uh, do a little bit of recall of what we're trying to do and where we are right now. As you recall, one of the principal uh, goals that we're pursuing here is to help you understand the basic components of impactful or effective climate change communication. Um, and that begins, um, as we will do today, with a big focus on the audience. Um, the audience-specific communication techniques, some key concepts here that um, you need to know about to help tailor what you have to say. And then, of course, we will spend time uh, including today and through the rest of this course, uh, focus on what it is that you want to say, what you want to convey to achieve the goals that you have in mind and practice that together as best as we can. Um, if you joined us today on the Zoom call, you will know um, that I place great importance um, on thinking about how emotions and values and identity worldviews and all those things play into the communication. Whether they're ever spoken, they're always there. It is not just something that happens in people's heads or ears, <laughs> but it goes far deeper and we need to be aware of that and account for that. And so those are the course goals. And of course, as I mentioned today, is that uh, principal focus on audience specific communication techniques. Um, I want to place this into the arc of the training. As you see in the first unit, we did just an introduction of what this course is about and what those basic components of strategic communication are. And we will focus today on that first element um, of, you know, how do you understand and explore who the audience is? How do you identify an audience? What goals do you have for that particular audience? And then how do you frame what you want to say and what do you say to them? What are the key messages that help you reach that particular audience? In the latter part of this training, we will then look at what motivates them, what gets in the way of taking the action that you want them to maybe take. We will particularly pay attention to the psychological, emotional, and other defenses people have, look at communication channels and messengers who are the right people to convey what we have to say. All of that was touched on at least um, today in some of our debrief in the Zoom meeting. And throughout, you will see we will iterate. We will iterate on the goals, on the audience, on the barriers, on the motivations, and including the goals, what we're trying to achieve. And then we're going to close this training with a look at how do we know it's working? How do we, what are the indicators that we are achieving the impact we do want to achieve? Let me do a quick review just to sort of bring it back to our attention, what sort of the key takeaways were from unit one. And that is the first one, really important um, and was clear in how you shared today what, you know, how you would approach a communication challenge is never just about the words that are being said or the language to use. It is about making a connection to the people. So not just deliver information. Um, we also heard about, and we're going to come back to this here today, about um, this, this notion that it's not just about helping people understand or educate them or even just only persuade them, but we have to understand that the reception of information and the acting on re uh, that information is deeply psychological and social, cultural, and political. You learned from Daniel Otengo um, about the basics of climate change and um, had a chance to review how he conveys that kind of information and had a chance to reflect on that. Um, I mentioned this before, um, this notion of the need to help people elevate all the reasons why they should act on something you have to say and help them to eliminate or minimize the barriers that get, get in the way of act, acting. And that is how you connect communication to action or an outcome that you want to see. Um, the other thing that I mentioned in Unit 1 and made a big uh, deal about is that it's not so much about communicating climate change. Um, it's not just about understanding the science, the technical details of it. Oftentimes, it is helping people understand how they can act on it, how they can make a change. It's not clear to people necessarily 
that, you know, they, they get that they should act, but they don't necessarily know how to act on it most effectively. And so, you know, my, my hope um, that you will take away from this is that if we can help people see how to make social change, we'll be far more effective than if we only help them see what climate change is all about. I also want to remind you very briefly um, uh, of where you can find course materials and also uh, show how we're adapting some of where we put these things because of um, the challenges we heard about in accessing the Google folder. In the cover email to this particular lecture, um, I put some suggestions of how to see if you can't access those materials in the Google folder after all. But for all intents and purposes, if that doesn't work, we will send them to you by email if you need them. So if you're not getting it, if you can't access it, let Michelle know and she will send you the links to the training slides, which will now include bigger slides um, so you can more easily read them. Um, it will include uh, access to the uh, exercise materials and worksheets, um, any supplementary materials, and including um, we will provide a link to the Zoom meeting that we had today and the chats um, that came through. So if you missed it and you want to recap, um, you have an opportunity to, to do that. There will be my lectures and we have today an interview for, um, with Petsy Athanas, Athanas and uh, she will, um, those videos will be um, on our YouTube channel, which seem to work for most of you, but we have heard that many of you have challenges with internet access, intermittent access, um, and also with the data costs involved. And so we're working on a solution to that as well. Stay tuned and probably I can already include something in the cover email. So um, we will get help to you as fast as we can. A couple uh, of words on the exercises, um, just to reflect on sort of where we are and what you already practiced. The first part, of course, was the where you self-introduced and brought to the table some of your existing strengths and skills and capacities, experiences with communication. Um, and it was wonderful to hear some of that this morning in our chat in the Zoom meeting, from humor to you know just being great teacher, being um, loving to connect to people um, and being good at it. Those are th those are the essential ingredients. Um, your passion and your desire to connect will be probably 90% <laughs> of what you need to make this happen. So, um, and, and then of course you got to practice that with uh, this uh, set of uh, scenarios, com challenging communication scenarios, and it was wonderful to hear how some of you approach that and you know how how already you can see that there is such expertise in the group and I just want to reiterate please reach out to each other to learn about you know an audience learn about how they do handle certain things resources can be shared so those are just you know reminders to you to, to that you already have a lot of skill uh, amongst yourselves um, then there was the second exercise where you all went out or at least looked out the window um, to realize and remember and see some of the um, impacts of climate change that are happening and how close they already are. There's not a far away problem. And you spoke to the many challenging emotions that this raises. Um, and I want to say to you, this is what happens for other people that you speak to the fears, the worries about their livelihoods, their properties, their homes. Those are all, those, those emotions are always going to be there. Um, and, you know, we have to address that or else they can get in the way. And then, of course, um, you had another exercise that was just a discussion on what are some of the worldviews and, and other hypotheses, social norms, uh, distractions that can get in the way of um, communicating climate change, why it's so difficult. So I re really appreciated some of your reflections on that and how much of that actually is not apparently just an American thing um, from you know where I took this example, but something that holds across cultures, even if the particulars of those norms and values and worldviews might be unique to your particular place, but they always are there. So with that, I want to then jump right into what do we mean by audience specific climate change communication and how do we do that? Well, a quick overview of what's going to come in this section. 
Um, I want to focus on this effective communication piece in in the equation of how to get from communication to action. Um, that if you take that apart, what's behind the word communication, it is a very strong focus on the audience and trying to understand the audience um, and the all important er imperative to actually understand and know your audience well. So many times we speak without knowing who we're talking to, what matters to them, and it's very difficult to connect them, right? So. Once you get to know your audience and can specify who it is you need to talk to, then you can actually define what do you want them to do? What, what are your goals? Um, and then how do you frame that? And how do you explain what you have to say? How do you help people put their brains around it um, and start developing and distilling what it is that they need to know? Because you know there's always a million things we could say, but how do you get to those three, four main things that you just want to keep coming back to. You'll see in this unit um, how this is an iterative thing. You might start out with one audience and develop one set of goals and then just end up thinking, you know what, that's not the right audience at all. It's just a subset of that audience or maybe someone else com completely that can make the big difference on achieving the goals you have. So we're going to go through that and, and you're going to practice that um, in the exercises with your partner. So this here, just a reminder, you have seen this um, particular slide, our four-part equation, if, uh, if you will, that connects communication to some kind of change you would like to see and the motivation and resistance in between. There are many different theories um, out there that you know try to get at this and um, they're all, not just only in psychology or not just in communication studies. You can find some theories in anthropology and sociology and whatnot. And I've basically distilled it down to this very simplistic um, equation that you see here in the four boxes. Today's focus is just going to be on the communication side of this. So audience. Um, You've probably heard this many times. The first rule of effective communication is know your audience. I cannot emphasize this enough. If we do not know where our audience is, what they think and believe and what matters to them, you may very well prepare the most amazing communication strategy and have so much wonderful thing to say and it goes right over their head. It might just simply not connect with anything that matters to them. So anything from here on out, I want to emphasize, hinges on you knowing more about your audience. And remember this, you have given me so many audiences that you all want to work with. It's quite a mix of different ones from, you know, this sort of claim of the general public uh, all the way to more specific things like students, professionals, tourists, resource managers, elected officials, utilities, and you name it. Well, what I want to do here in this next slide is to put a little bit of order, if you will, to this mix of audiences that you have, because there's really, you know, quite a jumble here in this. Um, and so let's let's see if we can think of this, um, how you define and delineate an audience a little more systematically. One way to think about it is delineating your audience by demographic character characteristics. So, for example, how do the young think about it versus the old? How do women think about it versus men or any other um, you know, of these demographic characteristics that I'm listing here, racial or ethnic groupings, level of educational achievement. So people with you know, concluded high school or with university uh, education and some without or poor people versus richer people. That's the kind of thing that you might think about here. Another way to think about audience is by geographic location. So in what jurisdictions you might want to compare, you know, across the different Seychellois islands, um, is there a difference in how people think about it? Or across um, Eastern Africa versus, you know, North America or uh, anything, uh, countries, urban rural, you might think of coastal residents versus inland mountainous uh, residents. So, you know, there's different ways to think about it, and it depends a little bit on what you are interested in or what you want to achieve and um, what, you know, the context is for your communication. 
Another way, and that came through a lot in your um, listing of audiences, uh, is that you might distinguish your audience by affiliation with a particular sector, profession, or role. Um, you see some examples here like farmers, fishermen, hoteliers, or when it comes to the issue of role, parents, patients, tourists. And what's interesting here, of course, is that, you know, one might be a tourist and a parent, right? Or a farmer and a patient. <laughs> so it's not mutually exclusive, but again, it depends on the purpose of what you're trying to get after and who you're interested in of how you might, um, how you might distinguish it. Another way to think about your audience is by how people lean politically. What is their ideology? Are they more on the liberal end, the left-wing end of the spectrum, or more on the conservative right-wing end of things? Um, in your country, you might use party affiliations as a way to distinguish. And the last one is that you simply look at the overall attitude toward a particular issue. Remember this example I gave you with the global warming six Americas that ranged from the alarmed on one end of the spectrum all the way over six um, different categories to the dismissive, people who just think this is all a hoax and go away with it, right? So the way we talk about this, this delineation of the audience um, is we call it audience segmentation. Um, and there is no one rule, there is no one better or, um, or worse. Uh, it is simply a matter of what are you most interested in um, and you know, what's the particular context. So if you're an elected official or you're in an advocacy group and you have a particular constituency you want to reach, then maybe that's your highest order of um, your, your, you know, first order characteristic. But I want to emphasize that, you know, beneath being an elected official or being a stakeholder of something, you're also a parent. You're also, you know, whatever profession you are. You also have a, p a particular geographic and place affiliation. You have different political leanings and so on and so forth. And some of the work that I've done I have um, focused on educators and learned that among educators, including science teachers, there are six Americas. In other words, there are alarmed uh, teachers and there are completely dismissive teachers. So they're not mutually exclusive. They cut across. And it's really important that we sort of dive in in uh, some detail to understand, well, what do they know? What do they believe? What do they care about? And I'm going to do that here um, just to, for, as a purpose for illustration. And I'm not going to go into much detail on each one of them, but just to give you a flavor of what that might look like. Um, here in this instance, we're going to distinguish how these six Americas differ in their beliefs about climate change, what they actually do about it, um, either politically or in their homes, um, what their preferred response is and their policy preferences, um, how much they care about the issue, how much they're involved and engage and pay attention to it, um, and the different questions they might have about it. So let me just start with one example, and I just want to remind you that if you want to read any of this in uh, detail, you can just hit the pause button on the video and read the text in more detail. But look at this here for the alarmed. So on the belief side, they're absolutely convinced that climate change is happening, it's occurring now, it's human cause, and it is urgent. We better do something about it. They tend to be quite egalitarian in their values and, um, and liberal in their political leanings. In terms of what they do, oftentimes this is where you find the activists. These are the ones who take personal action, political action, they're active in their communities to help out and in their own homes. They might have you know, changed all the light bulbs or changed a water heater to a more energy efficient one. They turn off the lights um, to save energy, that sort of thing. They believe that we need action at every scale, at the personal level, civic level, and government level. Um, they do not believe that if you just left it all to the market, it would take care of the problem. So they are in favor of government regulations and strong policies to reduce our energy use and the type of energy we have and, and so on and so forth. They're paying attention to this kind of news. When there's an article in the paper, when there's a story on the, on the radio, they will listen to it. They will not flip to another channel. <laughs> um, and they're quite interested actually in scientific news. Um, this is not true for all the rest of them. And they also 
believe and trust that scientists actually know something about this. They trust what the scientists are saying, even if they don't have the same level of, of depth of understanding of it. Their questions are not just what they can do personally, but what can the government do? How do we address this at the at the sort of you know level at which we really need to address it? Um, they do have some questions about well, what does it mean and what questions, but that's not their major issue. Now I'm gonna just flip through, and again, you can stop this video, just uh, read carefully what each one does. I just want to bring your attention all the way to the right to the column of the dismissive, just to contrast it most uh, directly. In terms of their beliefs, they're convinced it is not happening. Climate change is a hoax um, made up in China. <laughs> um, their behavior is quite interestingly, they're also civically active. They're just active on the exact opposite end of where the alarmed are active, right? They're active to prevent any policy or any action on climate change. Um, they tend to be socially and politically conservative um, and they also take energy efficiency action and conservation actions in their household, but they do it for completely different reasons. They do it because it saves energy, uh, saves money. Um, it, it's not because of climate change. <laughs> they would never uh, connect the two in their minds. They are opposed to any form of government. They are, you know, if the market can take care of it, if there's any reason to take care of anything in the first place, then let the market do it, but get out of the way. Um, certainly no government involvement, no, no uh, regulation or restrictions on the market or on themselves as individuals. Um, they're actively actually opposed um, to take action on reducing emissions. And if there's any news on it, they just trust it. <laughs> they just don't want to hear it. They just think it's made up, fake, um, whatever. And they're the ones who are least trusting of scientists. Now, if you were to get their attention and ask them, you know, if there's anything at all that they would want to know about climate change, they would want to know, well, not just is it happening, but how do we know it's happening and it's human caused? Uh, that's sort of the, the end of the questions that they have. You can see there's quite a difference. And if you just look across the uh, six Americas, the questions that dominate in bold here are always quite different across these different groups. So, you know, you come with the greatest science story, you come with the greatest um, discovery in scientific terms, and you're talking to an audience that's dismissive, you're just not going to get anywhere, right? So you would have to orient what you say in a way that speaks to what they want to hear and need to hear at this point in their, in their stage of thinking about it. Now, this is just the example here from the U.S. Um, I want to invite you to identify an audience in Seychelles that you are likely to work with and to explore in depth um, these types of things. What do they believe? What, what are their behaviors? What, you know, what do you know about their worldviews? How much are they involved in this issue to begin with? Um, based on all the thing you've, um, things you've thought about and discussed with your partner last time in terms of the things that would make it challenging. So the way we're going to do this um, is you're going to get this um, worksheet for exercise four, um, which basically asks you to, you know, connect with each other and then just dis dis discuss and decide with each other which audience do you want to focus on. And I just want to say, you know, if you have trouble deciding on one you can do two, you can do 10. It's just more work for you. So I'm not going to ask you to do that. Of course, you get more practice the more you do it. But you know, if just between you, you want to focus on one or two, it's absolutely fine. Um, I'm more interested in you going in depth to understand your audience and what the implications are of what you know about this audience than about you doing it 10 time but superficially. Okay, so in this worksheet, you will be asked to basically follow a few prompts, a few questions um, to really write down what you know about this audience. And what I'm suspecting is that you're going to find that sometimes you don't know very well. You might make educated guesses or you're just, you know, wildly guessing and you just simply don't know for sure. Well, if you don't know for sure, that's not a problem. It just means do a little bit of background research. Is there someone in this group that you could possibly call that might 
um, know more about this audience? Do you know someone in this audience that you can tr that you trust and you can just ask, what do you care about? What you know, what do you believe? Um, this is just for you to sort of get to know them. Maybe it's on the internet, you know, reading someone's website um, or some of their communiques, you might very well find, um, you know, the, these value statements embedded in, in what they truly believe. So I'm going to ask you to do a, as detailed as possible an audience profile and to discuss what you find with each other when you got that filled out and see, you know, what might make this communication with them challenging and what might actually help. What are some of the openings? Where can you reach them? That sort of thing. So I'm going to ask you now simply to go do that exercise. Um, you can click this one off and then come back to part two of unit two and then we'll continue working with that audience.